Good afternoon, Lisa Homie here. Hope you're all having a great day. Today we're gonna to talk about hair, skin, and nails. The objectives of this lecture are to focus on inspection and palpation of the skin system, the layers of the skin. Starting with the epidermis, it is an avascular layer, meaning there are no blood vessels in it at all. If I were to take a knife and cut into only the epidermis at that level, we would not bleed. The other thing contained in the epidermis are melanocytes. They are cells that produce our color and pigmentation. So comprising our three layers of the skin, in each layer, we can have cancer in each one of those layers. We can have a basal cell carcinoma, we can have a squamous cell, and we can have melanoma. So the epidermis is comprised of the basal cell layer. It also provides the waterproofing of our skin. Below the epidermis is the dermis, and it is comprised of collagen. The collagen gives strength, and it also contains elastin, which is like if I pulled the skin at my elbow and I, I pulled it back, it also gives it that recoil. The elastin gives the recoil, so otherwise, if we didn't have the elastin, we could pull the skin at our elbow and it would just snap and fall off, but it doesn't do that. Also contained in the dermis are blood vessels, nerves, lymph, connected tissue, and glands. And so if I took that same sharp knife and now I went through the epidermis into the dermis, now I would feel pain and I'd say, ouch. I'd also feel the touch of it because we have nerves. You'll bleed. And that's where our sweat and sebaceous glands are located. And let's just review the purpose of a sweat gland is to regulate body temp. So that'll cool us down by evaporation. That's the method it uses. And it'll steal heat from the body if it needs to um, in order, you know, for whatever purpose it needs. We also have sebaceous glands and their purpose is to secrete oil and sebum. And it'll also help to keep the water in or out. So the problem with the sebum is that bacteria love to eat sebum and that's called acne. Subcutaneous layer, what makes us look like us. I also wanted to mention this because this will make some of our health history questions make a little bit more sense. What causes skin color? So we know it comes from pigments. Melanin, it's a cell that produces pigment. Some people naturally produce larger amounts of melanin. Other people produce a very little. And the reason I'm mentioning this is I want to disprove a myth. So people of color, they can get skin cancer. There is a myth out there that says uh, black people are, do not get skin cancer, but that is not true. So here's the question that you want to ask. You want to ask a person of color if they're able to get a tan. If they're able to get a tan, then they are at risk for skin cancer. We also have melanin in the iris of our eye, produces our eye color. People get their color, their overall skin color from three things. So carotene is this orange tin, it's naturally produced by the derm. If a person has more carotene in their system, then their skin will tend to be a little bit more yellow. Apply that in a second. If a person has more vascularity or more blood vessels, in their skin, then their skin tone will tend to be more red. And the exception of this, of course, is if something has stimulated the fight or flight system. When we're in fight or flight, the sympathetic nervous system is activated. Epinephrine is a potent vasoconstrictor and it makes us pale or, or it could be ashy gray. People with an Asian descent have more carotene in their skin, so they will tend to have a more yellower looking pigment to their skin. People with African descent will have more melanin in their skin, so that will tend to make their skin look darker. People like European descent, those people have more blood vessels in their layer, which will give them a more reddish looking appearance overall. So so overall, the skin, we have three layers, epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous layers. The hair, the hair and nails are a different topic. They're actually called epidermal appendages. There are things that grow out of the skin. It is considered vestigial. What vestigial means or vestige means, it's a sign that something used to happen but it no longer does. So let me give you, and it's because of evolutionary things like from the time when we came from being an ape. Let me give you an example. Dogs need hair to protect them. Humans have hair, it doesn't really protect us, right? So evolution, we had more hair all over our body because we needed it a million years ago, but we don't have that purpose now. We Our hair is, has a different purpose, it's cosmetic. It's to identify ourselves, to make us more attractive, but that's pretty much it. We really don't need to have. Nails are also vestigial. We used to use them to claw, to protect ourselves, to do all this stuff, but we don't need to do that anymore. So our nails are strictly cosmetic, protect our fingers. The nail bed is very vascular. Okay, if you get your nails done and they push your cuticles back, you should actually not do that. It opens up that nail area and it makes it more susceptible to bacteria. The health history portion of that. So you wanna look for, does the patient have body odor issues? Do they have rashes, lesions, dryness, 
oiliness, drainage, bruising, swelling, and pigmentation, change in lesion appearance, feeling changes such as pain, are they able to feel changes, pain, pressure, itch, twitching, tingling, hair loss or changes, and nail changes. So here's how we prepare to do the skin assessment. You want to ask the client to take off everything but just a gown and remove all jewelry as well. Have the patient sit in a comfortable position, make sure there you provide privacy, and maintain a comfortable temperature of the room. You're going to need gloves, an exam light, a pen light, magnifying glass, centimeter ruler in case they have lesions or other things you need to document, woods light, examination, gown, or drape. For the inspection portion, you want to note any distinctive odors, generalized color variations, skin breakdown, primary, secondary, and, and or vascular lesions, and we'll go through those. So the color on your patient may vary. General pigmentation is usually consistent with their genetic background. Common pigmentations are freckles, moles, and birthmarks. Anyone with moles or birthmarks should perform a periodic skin self-exam. You wanna look for abnormal pallor, excessive paleness or whiteness, darker skin tends, abnormal pigmentation for someone with darker skin would be grayness. They could have erythema, which is redness, is a sign of vasodilation or inflammation. Rosacea is actually an infectious process, so that needs to be addressed with medication. Look for cyanosis. It's like a bluish tint to the skin. It's because of lack of oxygen. When we see that, it makes us think right away of pulmonary disease. Jaundice is a yellowing of the skin, which comes from excessive bilirubin. And another cause of that, something abnormal, is urea. So if a patient has high urea levels, they will have a uremic frost. The only time that we usually see this is in hospice or acute care, if a patient has decided not to take dialysis any longer, the main purpose of the kidneys is to remove urea. So when the kidneys are in failure, they have this crystals form all along this. You want to look at the skin temperature, but here's like variation of the skin tones that we may see. Here's some of the questions. So skin temperature, have an understanding of what's their blood flow like. So what is the moisture content of their skin? Can you check turgor? If you assess turgor, the easiest place, you can check it on the hand, arm, or over the sternum. Reds that say the only place you should check it is is over the sternum, that it's the most accurate. All other places can be conflictual. Wherever you choose to do it, I think that doing it on the hand is the easiest. You want to pinch the skin upwards and let go. It should go back and recoil immediately. If it doesn't and it stays tented, that is a significant late finding of dehydration. If this is what you see in your patient, either the patient didn't come into the hospital soon enough or you missed the boat and your patient's really, really sick, by the time they get to that, it's like game over. You wanna look for tattoos, lesions we're gonna spend time on, so I'm not gonna spend much time on it right now. You wanna look for areas of thickness, like do they have calluses, corns, or is it too thin? Thin areas of the skin is called atrophy of the skin. Is there edema, swelling? Is there bruising? Do they have spontaneous bruising? Don't have enough protein, they have a problem with their clotting factors, a liver problem, or you have to assess for domestic violence to make sure it's not coming from a traumatic reason. And then common skin color variations, we went over, we just went over all these. Oh, the one I missed is petechiae. They're just tiny pinpoint reddish purple spots. It's an extravasation of the blood under the skin. It can be associated with disorders or medications. Palpation, you want to palpate lesions, stand their texture, temperature, moisture, thickness of the skin, mobility, turgor, and edema. Now, now we're going to talk about lesions. To see a lesion, you want to note the location and is there any grouping? Do any of the lesions connect? Do they seem like they're linear, they're all in the same line, or are they discrete where they are not connected or grouped together with anything at all? Are they confluent, which is shaped like a crescent moon, and they typically are joining or running together? So linear would be a whole bunch of lesions in a row, like in a, a certain line. Annular, annular lesions are skin or it's like in a round pattern, a circular pattern pattern. Are the lesions elevated? And you want to note what the elevation is and then the color and the types of skin lesions. There's primary, secondary, and there are special skin lesions. Okay, let me give you a silly example to help you understand the difference between primary and secondary lesions. Okay, let's say you got a mosquito bite. The mosquito bite itself is this primary itchy bump that comes out of your skin. So it starts out as a primary lesion. It's a bump. You itch it and scratch it. Let's say you scratch it so much that it becomes bloody then that new thing with the blood and there's a scab on it now becomes a secondary lesion. Here's just some examples and I'm going to show you more. I also want to go through the ABCDE mnemonic. So A stands for asymmetry. So when you're looking at a lesion, primary purpose is looking for cancer. We want to rule that out right away. A lesion that is more asymmetric is more likely to be cancer. So we look for asymmetry. The B is stands for border. Is it well-defined? If it blends in more, if it has a defined border, it 
is less likely to be cancer. So if it blends in more, then it is more likely to be a cancerous lesion. So we look at color. Is the lesion solid in color or does it change throughout the lesion? So a lighter, darker, does it have variation? If there's more variation or more changes in colors, that's more likely to be cancer. D stands for diameter. So how big is it? The bigger, bigger, lesions are more likely to be cancer, so that's more concerning. E stands for elevation. So how raised is it? Is there exudate, bleeding, pus, or serous fluid coming from it? So you want to know the configuration. What's the shape? What's the distribution? Again, if there's more than one of them in a row in a line, it's linear. If they're in a circular pattern, they're annular. If they're kind of scattered all over, I mean, they're like all over the place, then that's considered diffuse. And then here's abnormal skin conditions. So vertiligo, cyanosis, and wow, there's holy jaundice Batman. Some examples of primary skin lesions, macula or a patch. A macule is just a patch of skin that's altered in color, but it's usually not elevated. A papule is a raised area of the skin tissue that's usually one centimeter around. It can be, it can have an appearance of sh different shapes or colors. It's not a diagnosis of disease at all. It can happen from something like razor burn, something kind of more benign. You could have a nodule or a tumor. If really worried about a nodule or tumor, they're going to find a way to biopsy it to understand understand what the makeup is of that nodule or tumor. Vesicle is a fluid-filled lesion. It's usually a half a centimeter. Boule are a fluid-filled sac or lesion that appears when fluid is trapped under the layer of skin. It's typically a blister. If you have more than one blister, it's called a bulla. I guess it's a bulla, what I have on the slide. A wheel is something that we get a PP, PPD test. It's a circular area of edema. It's usually circumscribed very well. It's actually what a hive is. So a hive is considered singular, a wheel. If we have a whole bunch of wheels together, it's considered urticaria. Just means it contains pus. A cyst is just a pocket of skin cells. And then here's what some of them look like from a pathophysiology perspective. Skin cancer. Most common type of cancer, there's three kinds. Again, for each layer in our skin, we are susceptible to having skin cancer. So we can have melanoma, basal cell carcinoma, or squamous cell carcinoma. Asians are less susceptible. Risk factors include sun exposure. If we have UV radiation from other sources, that it still puts us at risk. Certain medical therapies put us at risk. Certain chemos can cause that. Family history or genetic susceptibility. Moles, pigmentation irregularities, fair skin that burns and freckles easy, people with light hair, and age. Risk factors of skin cancer. You're more at risk if you're a male. You have exposure to chemicals. If you have HPV, you have zero derm pigmentosum. It is a genetic disorder in which there's a decreased ability to repair DNA damage that's caused by UV light. Long-term skin inflammation or injury, alcohol intake or smoking, inadequate niacin in the diet. We can reduce our risk by just not doing any of the other stuff. So we basically, we want to focus on the modifiable risk factors that we can change. If we have genetic susceptibility, you can't really help that. Person who has a lot of moles, make sure you get annual skin cancer screenings like a skin check. Do your best to wear sunblock and and cover your skin as best as you can. And then other things to make sure you have an adequate diet in B3, vitamin B3. And then here's the ABCDE mnemonic, which I already talked about. I love this guy. So he has pretty sun damaged skin over time. And then here's just, we're not going through burns, but here's just to show the depths of where burns go when you get a first, second, third degree burn. And then actinic keratosis, this is all sun damage, scaly rough surface, brown tannish, skin neoplasms themselves. So here's the ABCDE mnemonic again, and we're just going to keep moving. You would be, basal cell is the one that you would rather have. It rarely metastasizes or spreads to other places, arises from the squamous cell layer, which is in your epidermis of the skin. Melanoma is scary. It arises from the melanocytes in your skin, which is also, it's the most malignant and it easily spreads. Here's a picture of what some basal cells look like. So I'm just, I'm just all about the gross picture. So we'll just keep going. This is a few examples of squamous cell carcinoma. It rises primarily from epidermis dermal precancerous lesions, especially keratosis linked to the sun. It tends to be like granular, scaly. It bleeds more easily than usual. So that's also something that you worry about if you have something and it bleeds more easily. This is melanoma. That looks scary. So it comes, again, it has a regular border. So it's asymmetric, most malignant and deadly. It can spread to organs and other places really quickly. Who knew you can get melanoma? So here's unusual place. You can get melanoma because any place in the body, pigmentation, like I said, the iris, you can get 
cancer in any one of those places. But how about the fingernail? Who knew? You might just think that's like a fungus nail, but that's actually melanoma. And then here's a couple. These are benign lesions. So the one on the left is a cherry mangioma. Second one's actually an abscess. There is pus under there. The one on the right are just little, they're just cysts. So a collection of skin cells. Secondary skin lesions. So remember we talked about the mosquito bite gone wrong. You'll notice you could have erosion ulcers, scars, or fissures. And then pressure ulcers. We could talk a long time about that. And you can get them, patients at highest risk are people who don't, who lack perception, like people who are paralyzed, spinal cord injuries, people who have mobility issues, patients who are incontinent, who have moisture issues, they're at a very high risk. If they have nutritional deficiencies, if they have frictional shear against surfaces, that's why we have to be careful turning and repositioning patients. And any issue where the tissue tolerance is decreased puts them all at a much higher risk. Four stages, and I'm going to show them to you. Here's the different levels. This is not a skin lesion uh, pressure ulcer lecture by any means. So this is a nice to know, not a need to know. So I have it here to, for completeness, but we're going to keep moving. Just have a description of each one of the layers. We do everything we can to reduce our risk. This, I think we beat to death in the hospital so much so. And now a lot of places are using Mepilex dressings. Even if you go in for for a one-day procedure, we're putting prophylactic Mepilex, which is a nice soft dressing, over top of your bony prominences, wherever you're going to be positioned on the OR table or whatever it is, to reduce your risk of developing pressure ulcers. All the risk factors we mentioned in the beginning, you're just going to pay attention. If your patient's moist a lot, you're going to keep them as dry as possible. And then vascular skin lesions, ecchymosis is just, you hit a vein under there and it's bleeding under the skin. Petechiae, a vascular lesion, I did, you can see a venous star, telangiectasia, spider angioma, port wine stains, and cherry angiomas. So there can be cultural variations in the skin. And we did talk about those actually earlier with the uh, melanocytes. MRSA, they mentioned in the textbook, so I'm mentioning it. Our patient's are at high risk of developing MRSA skin infections. It's now community acquired, so it's everywhere. The other place that we're seeing a lot of MRSA are from spider bites. We worry about this like in high school with kids, contact sports, sharing personal items. If you have kids that they're aware of their risk for it, MRSA infections are really tough to clear up and they cause a lot of complications for patients. So things that we can do to reduce MRSA, keep our wounds covered, don't share your personal items. You're at a high risk of getting MRSA, getting your nails done, what a bummer. If if you're immunosuppressed, you have to be more careful. That goes without saying. Universal precautions, wash your hands and clean sports equipment between use. Like, And then scalp and nail, you want to inspect and palpate general color and condition, cleanliness, dryness, oiliness, parasites and lesions. You want to note the amount of distribution of scalp, body, axilla, and pubic hair because if there's a variation in it, remember if hair, hair follicles are dying off, there's a reason why that's happening. It could be low blood flow. Nail assessment, you want to look at grooming, cleanliness, nail color, marking, shape of nails. Palpation, you want to check texture, consistency, cap refill, and look for clubbing. Nail risk factors, so nails in a moistened environment are a problem. In healthcare, it's a problem in sterile areas 100%. So if you work in a procedure area, the OR, anything like that, they may not allow you to have nails. So any immune disorders put you at a higher risk. Skin conditions such as psoriasis or lichen. Some trades are professions, and then if you have something contagious, you can transmit it to someone else, and you may have a family disposition, predisposition to certain things. So to reduce your risk, you want to wear leather shoes except for sports. You want to wear socks that wick away moisture except when you're in an MRI because then it puts you at risk for getting a burn, getting an MR study. Avoid too much perspiration or water, so anything you can do to protect yourself from that. Avoid trauma to your nails and avoid unsanitary practices. Don't get your nails done. And then you want to assess capillary refill, hair color, and texture. Individuals of black African descent often have very dry scalps, dry fragile hair. Common nail disorders. Longitudinal ridging of the nails. It can mean disease or it may not mean disease. There's a new study that came out recently that said if you have ridging of the nails, you're more likely to have rheumatoid arthritis. Half and half nails can be a sign of chronic kidney disease 
or nail disease, you have pitting or little dents in your nails or your toenails. It can be a sign of psoriasis, eczema, joint inflammation. Coelonchia is a, what's called a spoon nail. It's a condition, it looks like a spoon, so your nail is shaped like a spoon. It's a condition that doesn't have enough healthy red blood cells. So symptoms could include brittle nails, weakness. People who are susceptible to that are people with iron deficiency. Yellow nail syndrome could happen for a variety of reasons. Your nails could turn yellow with allergic reaction. It could be a fungal infection. It could be a predictor of disease. It may not be. Bad news, ladies, if you get your nails done, paronychia is an infection of the tissue adjacent to the nail, most often a fingernail. It can be caused by injury irritation such as hangnail, cuticle, or having your hands or your nails be wet too much. Here's a picture of all those. There's an example of each one of those, a spoon nail ridging, all here in the slide. And then common aging changes. We get more pale, we tend to have more skin lesions, our skin dries out, we lose our turgor, our hair gets thinner, and our nails get more thickened and yellow and brittle. What do we validate and what do we document? So any health promotion activities, if they need health promotion activities, you also wanna mention that. What are the risks? Actual diagnoses, things you saw, collaborative problems and medical problems. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great rest of your day.